Good morning and welcome to Ordinary Life. Those of you in person and those of you online, I'm glad you're here and thanks always to the crew who makes it possible for us to do this. And um, we have gotten in the habit of uh, beginning in silence. So let's do that. Acknowledge that sacred mystery is here and present with us. And we pray to and from sacred mystery these words. We offer ourselves to you to build with us and do with us what you please. Relieve us from the bondage to the ego so that we may better grow into our true selves. And I want to share with you um, a book that I finished reading a couple of weeks ago. I found out about it, I think, on Richard Rohr's email list. And it's called Field of Compassion by Judy Canota. And um, she uh, talks about morphogenic fields. I guess the short way to talk about a morphogenic field is um, when a butterfly. The overlap of. The overlap of, of things. Kind of energy, yeah. And she is a, uh, so she's a, she's a scientist and she's a Roman Catholic. And she ends every chapter with a prayer. And uh, this one is one that I copied out because I just, I just think it's so good. Incomprehensible holy mystery. So often we are blind to your self-communication. So often we fail to see your love that is in plain view. Help us to see. Release us from our inattentional blindness. And allow us truly to see what is before us. May we release ourselves and others from judgment, and may we discover in the silence who we are in you and who you are in us. Enable us to grow into a maturity that embraces the world and participates co-creatively in the life of the world. May all of creation benefit from our practice of meditation. Amen. It's another reminder that you have to have a daily spiritual practice. I mean, she's really insistent on it, but it's a beautifully written book. And if you are uh, interested in something to enhance your own, the head part of your spiritual practice, I'd recommend it. So no, no matter who you are, no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, you, you are, are welcome, welcome here. here. Uh, I want to remind you that next week in this place, Diana Butler Bass will be speaking. Saturday at, I think it's 4.30. Is it 4.30? I've already registered for both Sherry and me. There will be a presentation in this room by Diana Butler Bass, followed by a meal. It's free, but they are requesting that you register. And then there will be another presentation. She is preaching at the 8.30 and 11 o'clock service and is going to be speaking here um, next Sunday. She hasn't let us know what the format of her time is going to be, so I don't know if it will be a talk, a dialogue. Um, we've yet to work that out. but um, We kind of went straight deep and forgot a few announcements. Should we backtrack? Well, it's time. Okay. <laughs> that was an announcement I just made. <laughs> was it really? <laughs> About Diana Butler Bass. Yes, okay. yeah, got that. Um, a couple of other things. Um, I forgot the piece of paper, but you can find it on the newsletter for St. Paul's Advent books are available, or what, not books, but whatever they are, handouts are available uh, either downstairs or in the sanctuary. Also, we're reaching that end of the year time when we uh, are ready to give the rest of our money away. And we've, as you know, uh, been doing that all year. Marcy Boyd, would you raise your hand? <laughs> um, she is our finance person now. We have a whole committee and um, we receive requests and honor each request that comes in to some degree. So if you're involved in a nonprofit or care about a nonprofit 
or someone you love is in a nonprofit, just submit requests for funding and we try to honor each of those as long as it's a 501c3. I'll make sure that that form is available online and able to be easily linked to, too. So. I, 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 I just can't thank you all enough for your generosity, and I'm glad we're able to do what we're able to do. Mm -hmm. Any other announcements? Calista, did I miss anything? I think we're good. We're good? Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, we're doing, as you know, a deep dive into the writing in the Christian scriptures known as the Gospel of John. And we are up to, once again, some of the most familiar, well-known stories in any religious tradition. Now we're breaking this down into two parts, part we're going to do today, and then uh, we'll be interrupted by Diana Butler Bass. Her book, Freeing Jesus, is really apt for what we're talking about right now. Um, at any rate, here's the story <laughs> that we're going to deal with uh, starting today. There was a man of the Pharisee sect, Nicodemus, a prominent leader among the Jews. Late one night, he visited Jesus and said, Rabbi, we all know you're a teacher straight from God. No one could do all the God-pointing, God-revealing acts you do if God weren't in on it. <laughs> Jesus said, you're absolutely right. Take it from me. Unless a person is born from above, it's not possible to see what I'm pointing to, to God's kingdom. How can anyone, said Nicodemus, be born who's already been born and grown up? <laughs> you can't re-enter your mother's womb and be born again. What are you saying with this born from above talk? I can't help but think Jesus would have responded a little cheekily. You are not listening. Let me say it again. Unless a person submits to this original creation, the wind hovering over the water creation, the invisible moving the visible, a baptism into a new life, it's not possible to enter God's kingdom. When you look at a baby, it's just that, a body you can look at and touch. But the person who takes shape within is formed by something you can't see and touch, the spirit, and becomes a living spirit. So don't be surprised when I tell you that you have to be born from above, out of this world, so to speak. You know well enough how the wind blows this way and that. You hear it rustling through the trees, but you have no idea where it comes from or where it's headed next. That's the way it is with everyone born from above, by the wind of God, the spirit of God. So uh, the devil once went for a walk with a friend and uh, they saw a man on the path down in front of them stoop down and pick something up from the ground. What did that man find, asked the devil's friend, and the devil said, a piece of the truth. Doesn't that disturb you, asked the friend. No, said the devil, I shall let him make a belief out of it. Hmm. So Marcus Borg was on a television program once, and beforehand he was told that he would have a minute and 15 seconds to answer this question. What was Jesus mm -hmm. like? <laughs> and this is how he answered that question. Jesus was from a peasant class. Clearly he was brilliant. His use of language was remarkable and poetic filled with images and stories. He had a metaphoric mind. He was not an ascetic, but world-affirming with a zest for life. There was a socio-political passion to him, like a Gandhi or a Martin Luther King. He challenged the domination system of his day. He was a religious ec ec ecstatic, a Jewish mystic, for whom God was an experiential reality. As such, Jesus was also a healer. And there seems to have been a spiritual presence around him like that reported of St. Francis or the present Dalai Lama. And as a figure of history, Jesus was an ambiguous figure. You could experience him and conclude that he was insane, as his family did, or that he was simply eccentric, or that he was a dangerous threat, or you could conclude that he was filled with the Spirit of God. 
Now, those of you who have read Shelby Spong's book, The Fourth Gospel, know that on almost every page, Spong goes out of his way to say that the Jesus that is presented to us in the Gospel of John is a Jesus who is about having life, not about becoming religious, not about achieving moral purity, not about winning some contest of doctrinal orthodoxy. It's about having life. For Spong, to be Christian is not so much about believing a doctrine, but it is about living a life with a radical love and inclusive love. Now, all of that being so, how did that message get boiled down to a sign being held up at a football game? <laughs> Today, for some reason, Bill, I'm really hearing your Tennessee accent. Bold down, and earlier you said own. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. So uh, we'll come back to John 3.16 in a bit. I, do, I would like just to go on record as saying I do not have a Tennessee accent. I do not okay. have a Tennessee accent. <laughs> just like I don't speak Texan. Um, so we'll come back to John 3.16 in a minute. But one of the topics we're talking about, of course, is rebirth. And birth is the ultimate symbol of life. All of us in this room were born at some point. But as we also know, we're not initiated into life just that one time. It happens over and over again at different developmental stages. There are two primary themes that we are sort of picking out of this story, and we're going to deal with both. But today it is, what does it mean to be born again? And then the second theme that we'll cover is, what is in the dark that needs to be brought to the light? Yeah, so we're dealing with the first. And this, for me, this being born again, is probably one of the most difficult aspects of Christianity to grapple with. It's especially in the evangelical movement, there's a lot of focus on being saved. And if I put this into developmental language, I would venture to say that traditional anxiety about salvation belongs in an immature, simplistic faith. If the only worry is, am I saved, then we've missed the message. If it's more concerned with beliefs and doctrine than with faith and transformation, then we're in what I love that uh, John Shelby Spong makes this difference between kingdom thinking and realm thinking. I'm going to hang out here for a second. And I, I think it's interesting that Eugene Peterson's translation uses kingdom because the more apt translation is realm. But we'll, I'm going to lean pretty heavily on some of what Spong writes. When we think of being born again as securing acceptance into a place or everlasting life, as a stay that never expires, a you know, one-way ticket that you get to just keep experiencing, then we're staying in dualistic mind. That's kingdom thinking. It's the up there and down here. It maintains a three-tiered universe of heaven, earth, and hell. And I can't, I can't make any claims about what happens after life on earth. I, I have no idea. And I'm sure that my attunement, however, to how I live my life here matters. And I would venture to say that for me, that matters more than what happens to me after I'm gone. I don't want to spend my life hoping I get to heaven. I want to spend it living as if I'm already here. So hear this. This is how Spong describes it. The kingdom of God is not a place. A far more accurate translation is what I just said. What these writers meant is realm. And a realm could be an experience of new levels of consciousness, the ability to see beyond the limits of physical vision. It's to understand that, as Alan Watts writes, we don't come into this world, we come out of it. As leaves from a tree, as the ocean waves, the universe peoples. People come out of this universe. Every individual is an expression of the whole realm of nature, a unique action of the total universe. This fact is rarely, if ever, experienced by most individuals. And Alan Watts continues to say that even those who know it to be true in theory do not often sense or feel it, but continue to be aware of themselves as isolated egos inside of bags of skin. I love that image. <laughs> 
So this is not my traditional understanding of a conversion experience, that we come out of this earth, which I experience people who have been converted as kind of having this holier than thou mindset. I, I bet nearly every one of us has met someone who has been newly converted to something, whether it's a eating raw movement or a smoothie diet or you know, these new converts love to convert others, right? And we might even have been that person ourselves being so sure of something that we want everyone around us to know about it. If we interpret, however, being born again through a dualistic lens, which very much drove early Greek thought, which the Jesus came out of, we utterly fail to understand the broader message. We stay in the concrete literal rather than move toward the symbolic and mysterious. When we're born the first time, I, I wish I had read this article before this morning. I woke up and read something about being born as, um, well, I'll backtrack. When, when we're born the first time, we're given a body that comes from a place of physical union. If we pause to think about that. We're, we're born from oneness. We cannot grow and evolve and transform into our present body without having been sustained by another body. The mother breathes for, eats for, and her heart beats for the baby. And this initial birth is painful, it's messy, it's hard, and it's often overwhelming. It comes after months of something growing, transforming, and changing. Perhaps when we're born again, we come into contact with this oneness again. To be born again is to enter into a conscious state of mystical union, a different state of consciousness that allows us to understand that union rather than experience it. It can be painful, messy, hard, and overwhelming to achieve this consciousness. This is what William James, who was what early part of the psychology movement and, and spirituality and mysticism, he called this seeking the something more that gives meaning and significance to our lives. Rebirth probably does not only happen once, but I think it happens again and again and again. It's an initiation, the first time we are reborn into a life of seeking. So um, the nearly 2,000 years of Christian history can be divided into three pretty uneven periods of time. Uh, the first is what I would call the age of faith. And this began with Jesus and the disciples. And you can see this faith reflected, this buoyant, life-transforming faith reflected in the document that we're taking this deep dive into in the Gospel of John. This was a time of both explosive growth in the Christian movement, and it was a time of brutal persecution for a variety of, of reasons. Followers of Jesus shared the spirit of Christ, and there was a great diversity among all the groups that existed of Jesus' followers. It was following that spirit that united them not a doctrinal statement. Faith meant hope. It meant the assurance of a dawning new era of freedom uh, and compassion that Jesus had demonstrated. And to be a Christian was to live with the faith of Jesus, not faith in Jesus. Those are dramatically different things. It was to embrace his hope. It was to follow him in the work that he had done, uh, living with love and compassion and in integrity. The next period can be um, called the age of belief. You know, we are, uh, as both Holly and I have talked about before, we are the first generation of people to know what we know about the cosmos. Mm -hmm. And we are also the first generation of people to know what we know about the development of the Christian movement and the writing of the Bible. Uh, when I was even in seminary and when I was in, certainly when I was in university studying this, we didn't have the information we have now 
about how the Bible was developed, and we did not have as much information as we have now about history and creedal, the development of creedal statements. There are a lot of reasons for that, which I will not go into right now. For one thing, the archaeologists had not done the discoveries that they have now, but even more importantly, the disciplines didn't talk to each other. Mm -hmm. So now that, that's, that, that's all changed. Uh, during this period, the age of uh, this second period, the church leaders began formulating indoctrination programs. It was for those who had been attracted to the movement. It was also for those who had never known Jesus, who had never met him. So it didn't take long before this process led to a replacing of faith uh, in Jesus to living by the faith of Jesus. I mean, I got that backwards. It didn't take long until living by the faith of Jesus got replaced by having faith in Jesus. During the closing years of the third century, an elite class came into existence. And um, we know now that there was no universally agreed upon church doctrine or practice. We know now that there was no such thing as apostolic succession. The people who created the doctrine of apostolic succession were those people who fabricated it because they wanted to stay in power. Hmm. Okay? That's how, that, that's how that happened. There was a wide and I would even say wild variety of beliefs and practices. And then comes along Constantine. And though he is given credit with making Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, he is not the one who did that. <laughs> what he did do was he took the movement over. Uh, he is the one that called the first church council. Uh, he imposed what Harvey Cox, one of my professors at Harvard, called a muscular leadership <laughs> over the church. He appointed and dismissed bishops. He paid salaries. He funded the building of churches. He was the real head of the church. So when people are upset about the mixture of politics and religion, <laughs> I want to point out that from the very get-go, Politics has run either explicitly or implicitly the church. Think of what you can't talk about in church. <laughs> so this is the period that we are still in called the institutional era. Era. By the way, it was Emperor Theodosius who made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. He did that in the hopes of building up the, the Roman Empire, consolidating the Roman Empire. Uh, but um, it did not save the empire from collapse, and it was a disastrous thing for the church. Its enthronement derailed the church, so that from an energetic movement of faith, it congealed into an army, as it were, of beliefs and doctrines, and this laid the foundation for every form of fundamentalism that would come down across the centuries. The empire became Christian, and Christianity became imperial. I'll give you one example. Hmm. Hmm. In the year 385, a gathering of bishops condemned a man whose name was Priscillian. He was from Avila. He probably took a lot of teasing for that name. But Priscilla. <laughs> he was condemned for heresy by the church. He and six of his followers were beheaded by Christians. This is the first recorded victim of Christian fundamentalism. Now, I know you're thinking of Stephen, but Stephen wasn't a victim of Christians. Anyway. Hmm. Now, what was this guy's heresy? He urged his followers to avoid meat and wine, he advocated for the careful study of Scripture. He allowed for what we would call charismatic practices or praise. And he also believed that various writings that had been excluded from the Christian canon, like the Gospel of Thomas and like the Gospel of Mary, had merit. So he holds the distinction of being the first Christian executed by his 
fellow Christians for his religious views. I read one church historian who estimated that in the two and a half centuries after Constantine, Christian leaders put to, get, put to death 25,000 people for their doctrinal incorrectness. Hmm. It was a confusing time. This is the time that gave birth to things like Chartres Cathedral, and it also gave birth to the Spanish Inquisition. It gave birth to Francis of Assisi, and it also gave birth to idiocy. <laughs> Either Jesus loved football or football loves Jesus. I'm not sure. But, you, you know, it just I, I just want to clarify <laughs> that. You see football players, and you'll see it this afternoon on professional football. They'll cross themselves and point to the sky when they make a touchdown and all that sort of stuff. Jesus is a hockey fan. Uh-uh. Baseball, man. Baseball. Baseball. Yes. God, oh, when are we going to get this right, Bill? Um, <laughs> But I, I just something that you were saying, though, those who are afraid of losing power do everything to keep it. Absolutely. Including co-opt a movement that was intended to be emancipatory, liberatory, and inclusive. So the powers that be co-opted something, made it theirs, and then made it part of the empire. Our job is to deconstruct that, <laughs> to unempire Jesus, as Jackie Lewis was fond of and saying. And you see that going on in American politics right now. Yeah. Why don't we have term limits? Power. Too much power. Yeah. So just as a reminder, we, we put this sign up about John 3.16, but I'll remind you what it says. You might, this is Eugene Peterson's translation. You might not be able to ver verbatim say this one with me, but you know how this goes, most likely. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son, and this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. If I read that according to traditional doctrinal beliefs, all of the air just leaves me. It, it's like our small self wants to be saved by someone else. That's like our small self says, yes, please save me. It's like damsel in distress waiting for Superman type of faith, right? Please save me. Superman, where are you? Um, <laughs> we, we've, we've been taught in some ways to be disempowered of our own beauty, strength, and, and capacity by relying on someone else. What Jesus did was show us a way to live so that we can empower all. If, if I read this literally, then all of what we're saying, really any credible biblical scholar says, is called into question. We have in more or less discredited the literal meaning of Jesus as God's one and only son and savior of the world. Not we, but credible bi biblical scholars. <laughs> we, they have discredited the purpose of Christianity as life everlasting in some other place. So how can we read this differently? What can we understand about this with an enlarged consciousness? This whole and lasting life that Jesus mentions is a choice we make, a choice about living with more love, more compassion, and more justice. And that choice is available to us at any given moment. It's not a savior. It's a choice we make to save one another. To quote William James again, I don't know why I was so drawn to him this week, but I was. And I refer to him because he tried to examine what we might call conversion experiences from a scientific point of view. So he tried to examine these sort of mystical moments and apply some reason to them. These mystical moments are very often not reasonable, but he tried to understand what are the threads that connect them. He looked at whether these calls to faith actually altered something in a person's living or whether they resulted in what I referred to earlier as just holier than thou thinking. Anyway, he says, the greatest use of a life is to spend it on something that will outlast it. I bet every one of us has a favorite person in our family. For me, it was my granny. She's, she's dead now, but she's outlasted her life because she had such an impact on everyone who was around her. She's outlasted her life. If that arc of time does indeed bend towards justice, what are we doing to ensure that we contribute to that arc? 
Or as Mary Oliver asked us through poetry, tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? I just want to point out that I sounded very Southern. Wild. I said wild. <laughs> I find poetry so helpful here. And I, I, I often read the, the gospel as kind of a form of poetry because it's both concrete but not literal. And for some reason this week, I also kept thinking of Emily Dickinson's poem that begins with, I am afraid to own a body. I am afraid to own a soul. She was writing as a woman when women were not thought to be intellectually capable, and she was an incredible wordsmith. The thing to get here from these two lines is that the body and soul are not distinct and separate. This evangelical idea of being born again assures us that our soul will be saved and that the body is of little consequence. And if our body is of little consequence, then the whole physical world is of little con consequence. And that says a whole heck of a lot about how we've treated the physical world and how we've treated one another. If we don't value the body, we don't value each other. Being born again is, of course, not literal here. And Spong and um, Sanford remind us of that over and over and over again in their chapters about this story. As Jesus tells Nicodemus, man, you've got to be kidding me. I'm not talking about going back into your mother's womb. It is not literal what I'm saying. You only get that one body. There's a cautionary tale that Spong says about being born again in religious circles. He says that uh, it can encourage immaturity and dependency. If we just continue to say, oh, Jesus has saved me, then we never learn to take personal responsibility for our own lives and for the lives of those around us. If we think about, <laughs> think about being born again, if we think non-dually, <laughs> that's impossible, right? Right. <laughs> uh, non-dual mind about being born again is about union, not separation. It does not separate body and soul. From Platonic philosophy to Cartesian dualism, we have learned that the body is inferior to the soul. I don't have a concrete answer as to what the soul is, but I feel certain that it's not separate from myself sitting here today. Taken non-literally and non-dually, being born again is a new dimension of life, not a religious status, not a fast track to heaven. Symbolic thinking or non-literal reading of this story enables us to comprehend truths that would otherwise escape us. If we're born again in this way, alive to a new form of consciousness, this is where we begin to see the imago Dei or the image of God in everything and everyone. The Sufi poet and weaver, I just found out he was a weaver. Did you know that? Mm, I didn't. That's, that's, I don't know that much about his I life, so. but he came from a family of weavers. He writes, inside the human body there is the seed, and inside the seed there is the human body again. Thinkers, listen. Tell me what you know of that is not inside the soul. Take a pitcher full of water and set it down on the water. Now it has water inside and water outside. We mustn't give it a name, lest silly people start talking again about the body and the soul. I love that. I'd never read that before. Mm. I, I was really glad to see that. <laughs> By the way, you know that uh, airline pilots refer to people on board a plane as so many souls on board, hmm. not passengers. I think it's very interesting that they do that. I'm sure you've all seen the bumper sticker that says born okay first time. It's <laughs> <laughs> funny. I, I grew up being taken usually three times a week hmm to a benignly fundamentalist Southern Baptist church. And it would be decades before I snapped to the fact that this, at the time, largest Protestant denomination in the United States was named after a geographical area of the country, <laughs> Southern. And that was due to the fact that it came into existence 
solely to affirm and to support the institution of slavery. Mm -hmm. So that church, like its denomination, was fiercely committed to a thing that they call foreign missions. And I cannot tell you how many adolescents struggling with all the issues that adolescence brings to all of us would walk down the aisle at the end of a service and dedicate their lives to special service. And that my goal is to be a medical missionary in Africa. Hmm. That's the goal. And yet, the people in that church could care less about people of color in the same community. Now, in the worship services that I attended, every single one of them ended with what was called an invitation hymn. <laughs> and um, anybody not familiar with that? You, you know, know what an invitation hymn is? So at the end of the, in the service, the minister would stand down the front and he would say, I want all of you, if you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, as we sing, just as I am without one plea, would you please come forward? And if nobody came, we'd sing it again. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> With every head bowed and every eye closed, we're going to pray. I know I sense there's a lost sinner here. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Oh, Same I, person every Sunday. <laughs> I, I, sometimes people would go just to get it over with, yeah. you know. The worst that I ever heard was an evangelist in Fort Worth said uh, at a youth revival, said, uh, I want all of you who are under 18 to come forward. I want to have a word with you. Mm -mm. So if you looked under 18, you went forward. At the, and then he said, now all of you who haven't accepted Jesus, uh, all of you who have accepted Jesus can go back to your seats. The rest of you stay here. That's, that's, that's religious abuse. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. religious abuse. Mm -hmm. That theology is uh, bankrupt today. Yeah. As uh, Michael Morewood reminded us, in, in light of um, what we now know about the cosmos, we are having to rethink everything about our theology and religious beliefs. Like it or not, whether it is recognized or not, there are two realities that affect everything. I know I've mentioned these to you before, but I wanna make sure you know what they are. One of them is that we have come to the end of cosmological dualism. You know what that means. It's what Holly was talking about, about non-duality. There is no up and down. It's all one piece. There's no dualism. That's what evolutionary cosmology is teaching us. That's what uh, quantum mechanic physics is teaching us. That's what it's all, all teaching us. It, there is no more cosmological dualism. You don't go to after. This is it. This is All Saints Sunday in the Christian calendar, and I did the opening in the worship service today. And I, on All Saints Sunday, we read the names of people who are part of this community who died since the last All Saints Sunday. And mm -hmm. I said, you know, you, I didn't say it this informally, but our name's going to be there sometime. And we have to let that shape how we live. In my own daily spiritual practice, I read a line, the first line that I read, I read it every single day. This may be the day that I die. May, I, may my awareness of this shape how I live this day. There is no more cosmological dualism. Now we have to think about that. We have to think, what does that mean now when we pray? As Morewood would say, what are you asking me to imagine mm -hmm. when I pray? And, and, and you just pay attention. Most prayers immediately take people up and out. Mm -hmm. I've said it a dozen times. The one thing I would like to be remembered about my teaching in this church is not about turn signals. 
Daily spiritual practice? No. Oh. oh. It's that God is not out there. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is, is that there is no individual salvation. Mm-hmm. We're all in this together. I believe along with, this is the faith of Jesus. It has been the faith of all the great spiritual teachers. It is the faith that I see in people like Richard Rohr and Jim Finley and others. My faith, I believe this, is if we can get it, that we are brothers and sisters, we will treat each other better. So, what does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to be born again? We now know, or we ought to, that it doesn't mean believing certain things in order to get certain rewards, especially the assurance of going to heaven. I heard somebody say or read somewhere sometime, people are worried about going to heaven when they don't know what to do with themselves on a rainy Sunday afternoon. (laughs) Now, virtual all, being saved assumes that we're lost, and I'm not saying we aren't. And more about that in a minute. Hmm. But uh, I, I'm, I'm not saying lost is implying some sort of original sin, that you were born into original sin, like born left-handed or born with red hair. In evangelical Christianity, the believer is helpless and hopeless until submitting to a higher power, or more accurately, until accepting Jesus as personal Lord. And even further... Believing that our sins were forgiven by his death on the cross. In this theology, the whole purpose of Jesus' life was his dying. Not his teaching, not how he lived, not what he gave as examples. But it's all focused in that that one thing. And, And Jesus was executed by the powers of the state because they accused him of sedition. Now, I do agree that the whole purpose of Christianity, as well as all the other living religions, is about salvation. However, salvation in John is not about ensuring a happy eternal resting place. It is about transformation. It's about transformation of ourselves. It's about transformation of our world. It is about transformation of society as a whole. Now, we'll get more into this in two weeks. Uh, <clears throat> but a good term for, for salvation or transformation is enlightenment. Jesus came as a light in our darkness. We live in dark times. I'm not being pessimistic or threatening, but we live in dark times. We need healing for our blindness that is dividing us. We need resurrection for the dead bodies that are often inside of us. Salvation means transformation from that kind of death into life right here, right now. So entering this mystical mindset is not a selfish flight from the world and avoidance of moral responsibility. So often we think of mystics as sort of removal from the world. But Jesus showed us a mystic who was of the world. He did not abandon it. He was completely human and completely spirit. Obedience to literalism and doctrine keeps us in that kingdom thinking. To enter realm thinking with this teaching, there's something we need to really unlearn that being born again is not an earth evacuation plan. John 3.16 gets so much attention in this story, but there's this other line that is so beautiful. I think it merits our attention, if not equally, then more so. Jesus said, you're not listening. Let me say it again. Unless a person submits to this original creation, the wind hovering over the water creation, the invisible moving the visible, a baptism into a new life, it is not possible to enter God's kingdom. I would replace kingdom with realm here, but the important part is about submitting to our origins in the wind hovering over the water creation. 
This should be, in many ways, an ecological rallying cry that reminds us we're not separate from the earth nor from each other. The, the Greek word cosmos means world, or more precisely, it means ordered arrangement. It does not just refer to the physical earth, but to the sometimes misguided spiritual order imposed upon it. It can manifest in a kind of collective consciousness, not to be confused with Jung's collective unconscious, not archetypal type of images, but a group think that can be malignant. So let's, the easiest one that we can all think of is not the case of Nazi Germany, right? Um, it is expressed in the far right extremism that is growing in our own country. It's the human tendency to think of ourselves as above or better than or separate from the natural world. This is not a good survival plan. We are in an era that is currently, though not officially, it has not officially been named such, operating under the name of the Anthropocene. Usually, it's this, so this era is so named because human activity has been the dominant influence on the climate and environment, and even on geologic layers of the Earth. Usually, epochs refer to geologic time and are characterized by natural phenomenon um, and the evolution of life on Earth. This, era named for humans is not a compliment. It means that we've done so much to change the earth that it is not, it is not operating optimally anymore. These are some artists and renderings of the Anthropocene that have been done between the 1500s, and I bet there were some before this, and today. Um, anyone familiar with Bruegel? Bruegel and Bosch were um, two fantastic artists. Um, this is his Babylon. 1500s. Second one is from the 1800s, Philip James' uh, drawing of a coal town at night. It's not natural. <laughs> and then most recently, a photograph from 2016 of landfills in Kenya. Yeah. So last week, the COP26 summit took place in Glasgow, which is where world leaders get together and they create plans and commitments toward the limit of rising global temperatures, where they're trying to say, well, let's, let's try to curb overall carbon footprints and emissions. And to really do this requires us to change how we use resources and to alter our consumer habits. It, it takes some change from us, too. It's not just a good idea to change it, but it's absolutely necessary to our survival and to the Earth's health, and therefore to our health. Humans, not a giant meteor or shifting landforms like the Ice Age or the uh, shifting of continents, are the cause of the sixth great extinction event. Climate change is not felt equally either. The poorest countries often suffer drought and extreme weather that wipe out their life-generating crops. So many of the migrants from Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador are, are coming because crops have been wiped out by extreme weather events. 70% of crops in Honduras have been lost. And there's not a livelihood there without agriculture. In our own city, neighborhoods with more shade trees. So this is a side-by-side -side aerial view of Gulfton and I think um, West U. And in these two neighborhoods, the, there is a 10 degree difference in temperature on a daily basis because one has more shade trees and the other doesn't. And neighborhoods correspond with wealth, and wealth in this city is, city is still so often corresponded with race. Gulfton, shown in the photo that I think you can tell which one is Gulfton, the one with the fewer trees, is a mostly low income immigrant community, immigrants from all over. And across the board, lower income communities generally have less access to green space. Our income should not decide whether we have access to, to good oxygen, to good air quality. On the same note, because trees impact air quality, those neighborhoods with poorer air quality have higher rates of cancer, higher rates of long-term illnesses. So climate change intersects with justice, race, health, and socioeconomic outcomes. These are all interrelated. We have the ability to change all this. I really believe we do. We have the ability to save ourselves, to contribute to the well-being of each other and the entire planet. In some ways, I blame Christianity and its dualistic thinking for our devastation of the Earth, this kind of Earth evacuation plan of 
you will be saved and you'll be admitted into heaven, has let us forget about the body, about the planet. We've too long held on to that idea of being born again than we have as a shift in consciousness. We have a split existence between body and soul, heaven and earth, above and below, people and animal, but nothing is actually separate. This split, Martin Buber, one of my favorite philosophers, called I-it thinking. If I see you as an it, then I don't actually conceive of you as part of me. And that is what must die. That way of thinking needs to die. We cannot conceive of each other as it's. Not, we, if we do, we miss seeing the true self in everything and everyone. Uh, I read something that said we need modern shamans to take us through such a journey. Anyone know this young woman, Greta Thunberg? Yeah. I don't know if she's a shaman or not, but she sure as heck is a courageous <laughs> young woman. She is 18. She's 18, and she is not afraid to show up and speak to the powers that be. She is like Jesus was in the temple. She is angry about climate injustice, and she's not going to stay quiet about it. She won't, and I just admire this so much. She shouldn't stay quiet about it. She feels that she and her generation, and she's right, are inheriting a mess. She criticizes the world leaders for not doing enough fast enough and uh, for being willing to sacrifice her generation for an intolerable situation. I love what she says here. No more blah, 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 she says. Some people say that we are being too radical, but the truth is, is that they are the ones who are radical. Fighting to save our life-supporting systems isn't radical at all. It's just what we should do. We're not just human beings with human capacities. We are part Earth part water, part fire, part air, and we're part each other. We come, our, our existence is because of generations of people who existed before us. We live and move and have our being with every other being on this planet. It is to this consciousness that I believe we are called to awaken. And I believe this is what John is writing about, awaken to a new consciousness, realizing that we are all interconnected. So after he preached a sermon on Sunday here, uh, Matt Russell was standing speaking to people as they left the congregation, and he was pretty edgy in his sermon. And uh, I don't understand people like that. <laughs> and somebody came up to Matt and said, um, are you a Christian? And Matt said, um, I don't know. Tell me what you think a Christian is, and I'll tell you whether I'm that or not. <laughs> so I would encourage you to have a definition for yourself of what it means to be a Christian. I am so grateful that there are people that I can look to who live a really radical, called-out life. Um, the guy I'm thinking about, is this guy, you know who this is? Mm -hmm. This is Shane Claiborne. Mm -hmm. Shane Claiborne lives in Philadelphia. He is part of what's called the New Monastic Movement. I've heard him speak in person, and when Tommy Williams, one of our former senior pastors, was at Westbury, he had Tommy come and speak in his church. And uh, Tommy doesn't take a fee. Uh, I mean, Shane, Shane doesn't yeah. take a fee. He, 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 he he will receive money, but it goes directly to their community. Yeah. He makes his own clothes, as you can tell, <laughs> probably. He makes his own shoes. He lives in Philadelphia in the slums. He and his compatriots go about uh, working with gang members, and they take guns, and they make weapons into useful tools. And uh, I brought this as kind of a show and tell. This is a Book of Common Prayer for the new monastic movement. Mm -hmm. And Shane Claiborne is one of the authors of this. And it's like any other Book of Common Prayer. Every, every day of the Christian year is mentioned. Talks about what the new monasticism is. On this day, the, uh, the 7th of November... It's, um, it's all about establishing our works in justice. 
Lord, make us anew out of the stuff that lasts. Um, it's a good book. Hmm. I mean, he's not a dullard. He's not stupid. He's quite a scholar. I think he was raised Baptist, by the way. <laughs> Probably Southern. I, I really believe that he does. <laughs> so we do, do we need saving? I follow Shane on uh, Twitter, and, and yesterday morning uh, there was this tweet from him, which I thought was instructive. The trial of the men who kill Auburn Arbery and the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse both show us that more guns are not making us safer and that white, fear, militant masculinity, and racism is a deadly cocktail. So do we need saving? I get Diana Butler Bass's online newsletter. I want to read to you a rather extended passage from this week's edition. Um, she's a woman who's going to be here next Sunday, and she's got an online newsletter called The Cottage, mm -hmm. and uh, it's worth subscribing to. You can Google that and look it up. Part of it is free. Part of it you can subscribe to. have a paid subscription. So this is her. I didn't sleep very well on Tuesday night following the Virginia elections. It was a grueling, ugly political campaign. It did not turn out as I had hoped and worked for. After turning off the television and the lights, I found myself tossing and turning, worried about the future and feeling sad that the real changes we've achieved in Virginia on human rights, prison reform, and the death penalty, environmental protection, and racial equality will be turned back by the next administration. Shivering in the dark, I felt afraid. On Wednesday, I discovered that I wasn't alone. I'm afraid, were the words most often heard yesterday from friends and colleagues. Not, I'm so disappointed, I'm angry, or we'll do better next time, but I'm afraid. I'm afraid. It wasn't exaggeration or a metaphor. I talked to people literally afraid, eyes wide with worry, all suffering from sleeplessness, talking of leaving the state, full of dread and a vague sense of communal terror, and saying things like, this is the end of democracy. Afraid. And while listening to my friends, I knew something else. If the election results had been the opposite, a group of conservative women sitting somewhere else in Virginia would be saying the exact same things as my liberal friends were saying. They were afraid. Mm. And when I push past my worries about policies and politics, that's what really makes me afraid, that we've come to fear one another. Regular people, moms over coffee, Hard-working parents, business people trying to stay afloat in a pandemic, churchgoers and skeptics, afraid of the other side, afraid of the end of things, afraid. My friends are afraid of white supremacy and Christofascism, the other side surely afraid of a godless woke mob, all afraid of what we care about. The worlds that we work and dream for are under threat. We have become each other's problem, enemies to be feared. Yep, we need saving. We need to be born again, transformed. And the being born again that is found in the Gospel of John is one of moving people from preoccupation and anxiety to presence and compassion. Salvation is about the individual transforming and also the transformation of the world. Transformation from a world of injustice to a world of justice. Transformation from a world of war to a world of peace. That's being born again, and in my humble opinion, we all need it on an ongoing, ever-going basis. No matter where you go this week, no matter what happens, remember this, you carry precious cargo, so watch your step, and I'll see you here with Diana Butler-Bath on Saturday night and next Sunday. Thank you. Yeah.